Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome back to season three of the Healthy Gut Podcast. I am so excited to be bringing you a brand new season of all things SIBO and gut health. And what better way to start back after a little bit of a hiatus than with the one and only Dr. Alison Seebecker. Today we're talking all about hydrogen dominant SIBO, what it is, why it's different to methane SIBO, although we'll talk about what methane SIBO is called in our next episode as that has been reclassified, and what you do to treat it. Now if you would like to get the transcription from today's episode, all you need to do is be a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's absolutely free to join. Just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast. Uh, head to today's episode or any of the episodes. Sign up as a member and you will receive an email with the transcription from today's episode. So without further ado, here is the wonderful Dr. Alison Seebecker. Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast, Dr. Alison Seebecker. It's so wonderful to have you back on the show for season three. So thanks for coming back on. Thanks for having me. We're going to be talking all about hydrogen SIBO today. And I'm really looking forward to just picking your brain on this uh, type of SIBO because it's the, it's the SIBO I've had my whole life of knowing about SIBO where I've been hydrogen dominant SIBO. And my listeners wanted me to do an episode where we just talked about this particular form of SIBO. Now, if you've got methane dominant SIBO, don't despair because we've got a methane Methane dominant SIBO episode, so you can tune into that. But do listen to this if you're interested, because it will help give you some understanding as to the differences. So, Dr. Alison Seebecker, let's start off with what is hydrogen dominant SIBO? What does that actually mean? Well, I think we all know who we're, we're listening what SIBO is, right? So, it's too many of our own bacteria overgrown in the small intestine. Uh, there are three types of SIBO that we can generally type based on the gases that we have. So there's hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide gas, we haven't had testing for. The, the um, technology and machinery hasn't been available. It is, it is coming available. But because of that, much less is known about that. But we know quite a lot about the hydrogen and methane types. So it's just a way, what it, what it means is First off, it's a way for us to understand like usually what your dominant symptoms are and how the treatment's going to go. It's just a way for, for all of us to have the same language and know what type of SIBO you have. Um, but also, uh, like I said on the, on the symptoms, usually we see a correlation. So if you have hydrogen type SIBO, it usually means you have diarrhea. That's the main association. And then for methane, it would be constipation. And if you had the two gases together, then you'd have a mixture of constipation and diarrhea. So that's like the main thing it means is what is your symptom and how do we think the whole treatment's going to go? Uh, actually, I could say a tad more about the bacteria. It also means uh, it, it reflects on the type of bacteria you have because certain bacteria make certain gases. So for hydrogen, it's just the normal commensal bacteria, commensal meaning like they should, they normally exist with us in our intestine. That's, that's what that is. Because with the methane and hydrogen sulfide types, it's a different type of microbe. But hydrogen type, it's just sort of like the regular, regularly coexisting bacteria that are in our intestinal tract. Let's talk about the symptoms, with diarrhea being the most common symptom, but are there other symptoms that are known uh, to be present when you've got hydrogen-dominant SIBO? Well, it's really just the main, the main symptoms we associate with SIBO. So abdominal bloating, also called distension, uh, pain or discomfort, and then the diarrhea. But with that will be urgency. Very often is urgency. Maybe not everyone has it, but I would say it's typical. It's the norm. So that is an extremely troubling part of the symptomology because when it strikes, you have to be near a, a, 
restroom. And if you're not near a restroom, it's bad. <laughs> so this is what really gets into affecting people's lifestyles. Because if they're going anywhere in their life, they out of their home, away from a, a restroom or a bathroom, they have to know where those bathrooms are and have access. And it's very upsetting. And like taking flights and, and journeys where you, you know, are limited access to a bathroom are troublesome. So that's a really major aspect there. Um, but some other symptoms that just go, no matter what type of SIBO you have, would be we know the symptoms come from eating or drinking, basically consuming, you know, <laughs> nutrients into our body. So that's terrible. It's a terrible thing that that's where our symptoms come from. And then um, you have food reactions, obviously, as I just mentioned, and it's usually to carbohydrates. So it could be the gastrointestinal symptoms, but it could also be uh, not digestive symptoms like headaches or whatever. You can have all kinds of symptoms that can happen. Brain fog, anxiety, and depression are common in SIBO, particularly the anxiety um, and fatigue. And then you can have acid reflux, you could have nausea, uh, pretty much anything you can think of. So, so that's basically the main thing here is the diarrhea and the urgency would be, and, and bloating uh, with some discomfort is the key thing. As someone who has had chronic constipation their whole life, I haven't needed or luckily had to experience too much of that urgency type diarrhea other than when I've had, say, food poisoning because I really don't get diarrhea very often. Every now and then I do, but my partner does. He gets it all the time, pretty much daily. And, you know, I can almost count the seconds particularly when he eats foods that we know trigger him and uh, he doesn't stop eating them. And it's literally like one, two, three, yep, off he goes. And he is, and he calls them his morning evacuations. Uh, and typical guy thing, he's just like, meh, whatever. Like I'm not, it doesn't bother me enough for me to change anything about my life or my, or to do another round of treatment. He did one round of treatment and decided that was enough, even though, he didn't clear his SIBO or really fully rectify the situation, uh, which, you know, I, I don't understand why he would do that, but that's his choice. Um, and it's, you know, it really is bothersome because he can get caught out if he's, if we're out at a cafe or we've gone somewhere and he doesn't have a restroom nearby, it can be really stressful watching, you know, what, how, what he goes through where he's like, we really need to get home right now, right now, right now. And if I'm driving, it's like, be fast, please drive quickly. Uh, it's a very different experience to what you know us constipated people go through. It and that we'll talk about that more in the methane uh, dominant SIBO episode. But that has its own host of problems and challenges. But you know, I really feel for the people with urgency because you know, really, if you're if you're not somewhere close to a restroom, it's quite a scary and frightening situation. Yes, and something else I didn't mention is that depending on how bad the diarrhea is and meaning how many times a day it is and also how the texture is, what the texture is, like how loose it is, how watery it is, it can be very debilitating. So because if you, then you lose electrolytes and you know, you're, you're losing your own bodily fluids and it's, it's tiring and debilitating and it can also cause weight loss. And so electrolytes are actually very important treatment for anyone that has diarrhea, no matter why they have the diarrhea. So that's something I didn't mention that's different from the methane type SIBO is there can be a level of debilitation. Let's talk about the treatment for hydrogen dominant SIBO. What, where do you approach or what do you do first? Is it about trying to get the diarrhea under control or just looking at electrolytes and, and dehydration in the very first instance for somebody that is dealing with very chronic and um, debilitating diarrhea? Or are you trying to get in and, and get that SIBO reduced in the first instance? How do you approach it? I guess it depends upon what's gone on for the person already and, and where they're at. Uh, if we know they have SIBO and their symptoms are, you know, still active, uh, I would say, you know, you can begin right away with, with treating the SIBO. It, it just sort of depends, like, where are you? If you haven't figured it out yet fully, then yes, you're going to go for symptom control. So let's, let's imagine somebody is not sure that they have SIBO and they're going to be tested. So in that case, what I would probably do is give symptomatic relief and, and the test at the same time. And so, and just take the test 
And then while you're waiting for the test to come back, do the symptomatic control. And you, you might not want to fiddle around too much with symptomatic treatments right before the test, you know, just so you can, you want to get a true baseline of what's going on, a true representation. But, uh, but if somebody already knows they have SIBO and they know that, you know, they need treatment, if they're in that circumstance, then just go ahead and give them the um, antibacterial treatments of, of your choice. And we can go over those. We will. And if you want to hear more about doing the SIBO breath test, take a listen to episode 82 with Eric Hamilton from Quintron. Uh, they're the manufacturers um, of one of the SIBO breath test uh, machines and home kits. Uh, it's the testing I've used every single time I've tested for SIBO. And we go through what it is, how you do it, what you can expect, all of those types of things. So great episode to listen to if you've never done a SIBO breath test. I just thought of something I should add about if we're going to, because you've already mentioned testing, there's a whole episode about it. But I just thought I'd mention one thing to keep in mind when you have diarrhea is you should not test if you had diarrhea that's out of your normal pattern. So let's say you normally have somewhere in the range of, you know, three to five bowel movements a day, but then you had 10 one day, you should wait one to two weeks. Typically, they say two weeks before doing your SIBO test because it could give you a false negative. When you have that much purging that's on top of your normal diarrhea, um, it could make your numbers look lower, actually. So uh, it's very can be very confusing to decide what's really different from because your normal pattern because a lot of people have an irregularly regular pattern. <laughs> so you have to be the judge of that. We're just looking for a, a massive amount more. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Mm, well, that's really interesting and great information. Um, can you tell me why it could give a false negative? What's happening um, if you've had, I guess, an increase in diarrhea that might make it look like you've, you don't have SIBO when in fact you do? Well, it's this, it's this purging so uh, sort of effect. So all this fluid uh, flushing down through the system that's, that's more than you are normally having. So you normally have diarrhea, but that's your normal state, right? But if you have an excessive amount, it can like physically wash away some of the bacteria. And we can see this with uh, colonoscopy. Uh, when people do preps for colonoscopy tests, they are asked to drink a lot of like saline types of laxatives to, to give a physical flushing so that there's nothing in there when they, when they put the camera camera and the, the tube and the scope up uh, for the colonoscopy that comes that comes through the rectum and um, we we've seen that when you do that that kind of purging it lowers SIBO scores uh, so but it's it's purging out of what is your norm you know pretty much so you know and if that's not going to be a long-term effective treatment strategy is to constantly massively overdose yourself and purge with that's nothing anybody wants to do or recommends but we're but re, the reason that that test was done was to show us that you have to have time after a colonoscopy before you test for SIBO that was why they did that they wanted they thought hmm I wonder and then they found yes if you did your colonoscopy prep you have to wait two weeks and then you can get your accurate SIBO test so uh, it's just a, like a physical purging wonderful great to know the types of treatments, there's antibiotics and there's herbals that are herbal antimicrobials and there's the elemental diet. Let's start off with the antibiotics. What What is commonly used to treat hydrogen dominant SIBO? We use rifaximin. That's the drug name and in at least in the US it's called Zyfaxan. I don't know its name in every country, <laughs> but uh, it is the just the main or um, not herb, uh, antibiotic pharmaceutical antibiotic that we use, and it is a very special and different antibiotic from typical antibiotics. So it is not a typical antibiotic. It is a, a better in its properties. So it's called an antibiotic with eubiotic properties. Eubiotic meaning good because it can actually help increase the lactobacillus and bifidus in the large intestine. So it, it does the opposite of what normal, typical antibiotics do. I don't exactly know how it does that. But uh, let's see from memory, I'll, I'll tell you the properties that I know. Well, first off, it doesn't absorb into the body, into the blood. So it stays in the intestine and works there, which is exactly what we want. It has its primary effect in the small intestine, mostly because it's bile soluble. And that's where we have bile, and then the bile gets reabsorbed at the end of the small intestine. So 
people often ask, well, if I have low bile, should what will rifaximin work as well? And it, it is an interesting thought, and you, you could consider taking some uh, bile support supplements. That is not usually the case with diarrhea people. Bile itself is associated with bowel movements. So taking bile could increase diarrhea. So this is not, you know, I don't think that's exactly pertinent to this discussion here, but um, it doesn't cause yeast overgrowth. It's been studied and shown, which typically antibiotics can do vaginal yeast infections and just general yeast overgrowth, even in the intestines. It's been shown not to do that. It has been shown to inhibit the uh, antibiotic resistance of other antibiotics. That's very good. It is very safe. It has about the same side effect profile as the placebo in studies. I will say that I certainly have sent, seen people have reactions to it, uh, but I see people have reactions to absolutely everything. And I think SIBO patients have a lot of reactions to anything they put in their body, whether it's a supplement or food, right? So, uh, you know, not to say there will be no side effects because I've seen it, but out of everything that we use for SIBO, I think it has the least side effects and it can be reused with still efficacy like technically in studies there's no antibiotic resistance to it yet. I see what we would call clinical resistance fairly commonly not all the time like I, I would say it's maybe a little I would say maybe like two I'm sorry like one third that I see the res clinical resistance maybe a little bit more than that but it's spotty. So it's like you use it and it might have a great effect. And then maybe the second time you use it, maybe it didn't have as good as an effect. The third time, you're back to having a good effect. I, you know, I don't know. And it, 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 the time period you sp space this all out can have an effect on that. But, uh, but technically, there's no antibiotic resistance. And it can um, also decrease inflammation. That's one of its key things. I think that's why it's tolerated so well in general by people. So it's anti-inflammatory through the PXR gene uh, through the NF kappa B pathway of inflammation just for anybody who knows these <laughs> medical pathways of inflammation but this is a, a inflammatory pathway that's self-perpetuating meaning its end products turn it back on so it just constantly is in a cycle and something needs to come in and turn that off and rifaximin can do that so it's very special in that way so those are the things I can remember off the top of my head <laughs> How interesting. Um, it is a, a commonly prescribed antibiotic for SIBO, but it can also be prohibitively expensive. Why is it so expensive for so many people? It, you know, And it really depends on the country the, where you are, which seems to have a big impact on price. I wish I knew. Um, I think it's really awful that it is as expensive as it is because it's a, so unique and so positive. I guess, I guess you know, they can jack the price up because it's the only thing like it, right? I don't like it that it's that expensive. Um, but I don't know why. What, uh, what people in the U.S. can do is it has been approved for IBS with diarrhea. So if you give a diagnosis of IBS with diarrhea, which is what SIBO is in most cases, unless they're not having the symptoms of IBS, but the symptoms of IBS are the same as SIBO. <laughs> so you can give them that diagnosis and hopefully their insurance will cover it. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of spotty coverage here and you hear all sorts of stories and different tricks and ways to get insurance coverage. I would say call the local rep, like ask your, if this is a patient listening, ask your doctor to call their representative uh, for Rifaximin and ask for their advice and the best way to get coverage. They're there to help you. And uh, they used to have a patient assistance program I think they may still, so you can ask about that. Also, there have been coupons that lower the cost significantly, sometimes even helping to get it for free. Another thing is there could be samples given to the doctor's offices by the rep. You can ask for that. You know, you may not get your full amount covered, but you could get some. And uh, then the other thing people do, and I'm speaking mostly from the U.S. because that's what I know, is they would look for generic rifaximin, which is technically a little bit of a different substance in that it will absorb systemically to some amount, not com completely, but to some much stronger amount, and try one of those generic brands. And those have to be gotten from another country. I tried that very early on in my career with brands that were coming from India. And I had 
not just me, myself and my, our, our colleagues had very, very bad uh, response with that. Very bad. But I have a lot of colleagues who have found certain generic brands, which I don't know the names of. Uh, I think they've tried some that come from Italy. Well, actually, from Italy, you can get actual branded Rifaximin, the, the brand real <laughs> Rifaximin, like pharmacologically the same. And it's about like half the price. I, I forgot to mention that. So that's that's an option. But this is something different I'm mentioning where it's like an actual generic. So it's not even pharmacologically exactly the same and have had very good results. So Dr. Mornstein has often, uh, Dr. Mona Mornstein, she often talks that she uses generics, but I don't know what brand. We've had Dr. Mona Mornstein on the Healthy Gut podcast and uh, uh, we'll see, I'll see if I can get some of that information and put it in the show notes for this episode. Um, what other pharmaceuticals can we use to treat hydrogen dominant SIBO? Well, you could use uh, like Alinea, which is a uh, that's the brand name, not azoxanide is the drug name. That can probably be used for most m many different types of SIBO. It's an antiparasitic and an antibacterial. And people have a lot of good responses with that. That can be uh, also prohibitively expensive depending upon your country. I know a lot of people from the US, uh, I'm, I live on the West Coast, and they will, a lot of people from the West Coast take their vacations in Mexico. And in Mexico, you can get uh, many of these pharmaceuticals inexpensively. So they'll, you know, go on vacation and stock up on these things, you know. So, but you could use really m many different anti um, antibiotics, pharmaceutical antibiotics. It's just that, sorry, stop myself there. Many have been used throughout um, the last like 20 years or so. And there's many published published studies on this, but the efficacy rates are so much lower, so much lower than rifaximin, which is why people work so hard at getting it and, you know, finding it to get covered. Because, you know, who really wants to be on all these different multiple rounds of pharmaceutical antibiotics, especially all these ones that don't have these good properties that rifaximin has? Like, why would you use anything but rifaximin? The only reason really would be either you're allergic to it or the cost. And so if you can find a way to make the cost reasonable, it is superior in efficacy and, and safety and properties. But you can use whatever else you want. So studies have been done on like Cipro and metronidazole used a lot. Again, much lower efficacy. Um, various of the um, aminoglycosides like neomycin, which we use in the methane type, and doxycycline has been used a lot. So it would just sort of be any, I mean, people have used um, amoxicillin, you know, anything you would think of, any, any antibiotic has been used. None of them compare in, in the rates of effectiveness. Are there any antibiotics that we should categorically avoid if a doctor is prescribing for SIBO, perhaps the doctor doesn't know much about SIBO and they're prescribing. Uh, and I see a lot of fear in some of the online communities with people questioning the antibiotics they've been given. They've perhaps come to your website, SIBOinfo.com. You've got great resources there around what is commonly used for treatment and it might not be listed and they're freaking out because they're like, but why am I being told to follow this antibiotic when Dr. Alison Seebecker doesn't list it as um, a commonly used treatment option? This is an interesting question. So I feel bad about any any way in which I could be incur you know, encouraging people to be afraid. I think probably what's going on there is that the doctor, so many doctors still don't even have the basic education on SIBO. And I don't fault them for that because, you, you know, until you know something, you don't know it. So they just don't know. Uh, what would be great is if they could be directed to read about it, like on, you know, my website. I actually originally wrote it for doctors, believe it or not. Uh, so, or some articles, then, then they might learn, oh, the actual standard of care is rifaximin. So, I mean, you know, basically for the last 15 years, 10, 10 year, yeah, 10 to 15 years, pretty much almost no studies have been done on any antibiotic for SIBO other than rifaximin. It's, it is the standard of care. So they just don't know. So that's I would assume why they're prescribing something else. The other reason would be cost, and they are trying to make sure they get something covered on the patient's insurance. So to your question, is there anything we should absolutely avoid? I, I don't think so 
categorically, it's, it's a matter of the best match for the patient. So there are some antibiotics that have very high rates of causing Clostridium difficile, antibiotic-induced diarrhea. So that would be a legitimate concern, you know, if we put aside the efficacy I- issue here, would be, you know, that would be something that a person has reasonable right to be afraid of. <laughs> you know? And, you know, that, oh gosh, this antibiotic causes C. diff in a lot of people, could we choose something else? You know, I know Cip- uh, Cipro and some, there are some other antibiotics often do, but, you know, even saying that, Ciprofloxin, uh, you see it given all the time for urinary tract infections, and most most everybody I see who's being given that does not get C. diff. So, these, you know, you have to take these rates into perspective. Let's think about the herbal approach, and it's the route that I went originally. I was really scared of taking antibiotics, and there's this whole fear piece that, uh, uh, you know, really does occur for SIBO patients where we just become so fearful of, of lots of things because we've often been sick for such a long time and we just don't want anything to make us worse. I decided that I wanted to do the herbal antimicrobials because I had never heard of rifaximin. I didn't know anything about it and I just didn't want to do another round of antibiotics. And it was only when I learned about um, how useful rifaximin is that I lessened my stance and thought, well, if I choose to do antibiotics in the future, I will do rifaximin, but I won't do, you know, just more general antibiotic. I'll go for the one that is the best standard of care. What are the herbs that we can use in hydrogen dominant SIBO? That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. What are the herbs that we can use in hydrogen dominant SIBO? So the herbs are the the main single herbs, like just speaking individually about them would be any herb that has berberine in it. So that's herbs like golden seal, Oregon grape, bearberry. It's not barberry. <laughs> I have to get that right. Bearberry. Coptis, which I think is also called gold thread. And there's probably something I'm forgetting. Yerba mansa. There's others. There are others. Uh, there. It's a yellow colored constituent. So you'll you'll usually see a more yellowy type of looking herb. Not always, but more so. And what we commonly do is we just will use a formula that has a couple of those herbs in it that contain berberine. So like one we would always use by integrative therapeutics is berberine complex. And I think it has three of those in there. Golden seal, organ grape, and I think bearberry, if I got that right. <laughs> I'm not sure. And then you'll see some that have, will have two, but I often will just use like just golden seal or just organ grape. So those are all options. Uh, and I do want to just mention the dose for, uh, for myself and my colleagues who, uh, who have, I've worked closely with who tend to see a lot of SIBO were specialists. So we tend to see the people that have failed other treatment. We have found that you need to go in a much higher dose. Uh, So what we typically do here is we do five grams, which is 5,000 milligrams. A lot of my colleagues who don't see the the worst sort of most challenging cases will find that three grams is enough. And then my colleagues who uh, see more of the easier cases uh, or the sort of the cases that aren't chronic and can resolve quickly, they find they can go even lower than that. But in my practice, I found that was actually one of the key things I could fix that would make a huge difference is we could simply repeat berberine, but at a much higher, more, what I would consider proper dose, and bam, they'd get good results. So I just wanted to mention that. I, I still recommend five grams. If you want to do four or three, go for it. But just, you know, five grams is, I think the higher you go, the more effect you're going to get. So that's the berberine. Next would be uh, oregano. And you can get this as a dry tablet, or you can get it as oil in a capsule. And I prefer the dry tablet because it's a little less irritating to people's digestive system. Not everybody's irritated by it. In fact, most people aren't, but but then many are. So it can be sort of physically caustic and uh, sort of 
create a sort of like a feeling of almost like burning or just like actual pain. And you just know it because you didn't have that type of pain, but then you took your oregano and you got it. So if that happens to you, that's, it's not a match for you and you shouldn't take oregano. But uh, I think that the tablet, the dry tablet, is less that way. I've seen that. And also, we can use less amount of pills versus the oil. The oil in the capsule, the dosing is like double the amount. And so the one that we tend to use is by Biotics, and it's called ADP. I don't actually know what that stands for. It's oregano, but the product is called ADP. So, and that we take usually for, uh, sorry, six tablets a day. We used to do four but six works better. It always works better when you do more, but then it's more money and you know, you need to find that. It, always you want to find the dose, the lowest dose you can for effectiveness. So that's oregano. And then we have neem and neem is also very effective and that's N-E-E-M and it's an Indian herb. And the one that we've tended to use comes in a formula with a little bit of triphala. Triphala is a three fruit blend that's an Ayur, tr- traditional Ayurvedic formula that has a little bit of a prokinetic effect, meaning it can help stimulate the movement in the small intestine, which is okay for diarrhea patients, and it's what we want. Uh, but you don't have to do it with that. We just we have good results with that one. It's by Ayush, and it's called Neem Plus. But you can just buy plain neem as well. But we're looking for neem leaf that's powdered in the capsules. Neem oil has some toxicity concerns, and it's not safe for children. But that is that's... A very different thing. We want the, the the capsules that you would buy in the store. It's it's the leaf. It's not going to be oil. So those are our three main herbs that we tend to rely upon. Also, cinnamon can be used. I just don't use it that much because it's a hot, spicy herb and can bother people's lining of their stomach, similar to how oregano can. So uh, those are our three main ones. And what I typically do is use two together. You could just do one. I find a a little bit better effect if I do two. But if I go to using all three, I do not get more benefit. I have not seen that. So I think two is the sweet spot. Now, that is the single herb approach. There are so many other herbal antibiotics and people have their favorites. And what a lot of doctors like to do is they'll, they'll choose a formula where it has a whole bunch of herbal antibiotics and then it'll have herbal antifungals. Actually, all three of the herbal antibiotics I just mentioned are also antifungals. So they work against yeast as well. They're just better, I think, at, at killing bacteria than yeast as compared to some of the traditional antifungal herbs, which are better at yeast versus bacteria. Um, So anyway, these big formulas will have that, and then they'll usually have antiparasitics in them as well, which predominantly is black walnut and wormwood. And I, I myself don't favor that approach. And the reason why is there's nothing wrong with it at all. I have to say that straight up. It's because of the type of patient I see. And so I'm seeing people that have failed a lot of treatment, and they're very sensitive. And I don't want to give them, you know, a, a formula with more than about two or three things. Because then if they are reacting negatively, it's so easy then for me to just, well, I'll just eliminate one of the two items and let me see how you do. (laughs) And um, on that note, I have had trouble with, if I use the berberine complex formula and it has those three berberine herbs, I've had trouble with that at, at times where someone's reacting to it and I don't know which of the three herbs. And so I have experimented with my patients and in at least one case I'm thinking of, it was gold seal and that and golden seal gave this one particular patient diarrhea, but none of the other berberine herbs did. She truly just had a trouble with that particular herb. So uh, for that reason, I like to simplify. And the other reason is because I like to, I, I see so much clinical resistance. I, for, for lack of a better word, we'll call it antibiotic resistance, herbal antibiotic resistance, but it's clinical resistance. And so I I can wear out the effect of herbs. And so I don't want to give a bunch of things all at once because then I've given everything. And usually the people I see need more than one round of treatment. So what am I going to use now? So it's just logistical is the reason why I prefer it. But particularly doctors, when they're first seeing patients, and they don't know, are they going to be sensitive? Are they going to be chronic? They don't know. So they start out with this big complex formula, and it often goes very well. It's very well... uh, tolerated and um, effective in most practitioners' offices. So what would these formulas be? Oh my God, there's just every company has one. Every company has like an, you know, antibacterial-esque antimicrobial formula. And I, I don't even know if I should 
could mention them. There's just so many. And you just use your favorite, you know. But I do want to point out that sometimes the berberine dosing in there is not high enough and you might not get effect just using it as on the label and you might be better to just add a little berberine in with it. If you're having trouble, you could think of that. And the other thing is that many of these will have garlic that is whole or uh, garlic oil in these combination formulas and garlic is a, a high fermentable item. It has a lot of FOS and it can really aggravate people. So that's one thing you'd want to watch out for. I, I've seen it time and time again. And, and it it's probably more of a factor in small formulas, meaning, you know, five or less herbs are in it and garlic's one of them because then you know the proportion is likely higher and then it's aggravating. And s look, some people can tolerate garlic in pills. Uh, and it's usually what I call the, the one third. They're the one third that are not chronic. We know about one third of cases are not chronic and they resolve fairly easily. Two thirds are chronic. So the one third, they can even just eat garlic and they're fine, you know? So some people can handle it, but a lot of people can't. So I wanted to mention that. So those are, that's the main thing. It's funny you talk about that with the garlic. I've always been able to eat garlic and I've got chronic relapsing SIBO. I can eat whole garlic. I can eat raw garlic and onions. Onion and garlic just doesn't bother me. We're all so jealous. <laughs> it's so amazing that, uh, yeah, out of all the things that have bothered me over with food over my life, onion and garlic aren't the culprits. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray for that. <laughs> Um, what about the elemental diet? Is how, how do you, um, effective do you find that for hydrogen dominant SIBO? Very, very, very effective. It's effect, I find it equally effective for methane. It's just effective. <laughs> it's really effective. Now, something I should say is that amongst those three treatments, pharmaceutical, herbal, antibiotics, both of those, and then elemental diet, often we will. By the way, we're recording in a city, so you might hear some sirens coming by. <laughs> um, Often we will find, it's okay to keep talking. I, I just had to check because it's so noisy. I know, we've got, we're right in downtown Seattle here for SIBOCon 2019. <laughs> and yeah, all the sirens are going past Sorry. at the moment. Sorry, listeners. Okay, so uh, out of those three, in, in a more challenging circumstance, you know, not somebody who, bam, they just take one treatment and they're done. Um, often two of those methods really aren't a match and just don't work well for somebody it could it could be that a person reacts poorly like they have side effects but really even more so what i'm meaning is actual effectiveness of removing symptoms and lowering the lowering the test and making the test go negative so this is just so common so you know like you try pharmaceutical antibiotics and meh you know you try herbals meh you go elemental diet fabulous but then it could be the opposite you try elemental diet first because you know it's like the most effective and it can reduce really high gas and one two week course and so you do it and it just didn't suit and you didn't really get a response like maybe you didn't lower at all and then you go and try herbs and bam it's done and I, the only thing i know how to explain that is just you know each each method has its own mechanisms of the ways it acts and it's just suits maybe that person's composition of bacteria versus the next person. So yes, elemental diet is incredibly effective for hydrogen SIBO. Let's talk about when your symptoms aren't typical. We know traditionally hydrogen dominant SIBO equals diarrhea. But I've had hydrogen dominant SIBO my whole life. Well, as long as I, I think I've had SIBO my whole life. But as long as I've known about SIBO and every time I've tested, I've always been hydrogen dominant. And only on my last breath test after, after the elemental diet did any methane show at all. I've never had any methane whatsoever yet I've got chronic constipation. And we know that there are this small subset of people where their symptoms don't fall into the kind of known categories what's going on there why are why are people like me not sitting in the diarrhea camp even though we've got hydrogen SIBO okay so there's this this one thought I can explain and we actually were chatting about this before we started recording and your particular case is so interesting so please be sure to mention more of what we think your situation is but Dr. Pimentel for just about as long as I can remember has talked about a circumstance where there is undetectable methane, undetectable on the breath test. And so this is how he, he talks about it. He says that uh, what they've done some stool sampling uh, on people and they can see when the level of methanogens, the 
bugs that make the methane are between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6 on the stool. It will correlate with a symptom of constipation, but it will not be detectable on the breath test. And the reason why is because the breath test is in parts per million, and we would have needed it in parts per billion to pick up that level of gas. So there is methane gas being made, and it is creating constipation. It correlates with a certain level of these bugs in the stool, but we can't see it on the breath test. So the breath test will look negative. So that would be one theory about why somebody could have hydrogen only, but still have constipation. But now share your thing. So I've in recent times discovered adhesions and learned that I've got a, um, an abdomen full of adhesions and that I think is what's causing my constipation. And Alison, you asked me a really interesting question. You said to me, do you ever get thin stools? And I do, not all the time, but I do get thin, like pencil thin stools. And That's actually what they're called. They're called pencil thin stools. Yeah, and tell me <laughs> that, what that means. That is a sign of obstruction, some kind of Obviously, it would be partial obstruction because a full obstruction, nothing's happening, nothing, no bowel movements, and you're going to the emergency room. But uh, that's that's uh, one of our signs. It's also a sign of uh, cramping, like so when the muscles cramp and contract and tamp down so that they're constricting uh, the tube to be very small and narrow, and then the stool forms that shape. Uh, but that is the same. You know, as soon as you said adhesions and you think that's why you're constipated, you know, because this is pretty unusual to have hi uh, hydrogen and constipation, I immediately just in my mind saw the pencil stools, you know, that the constriction of the, of the adhesions narrowing, narrowing the bowels. And so that is very likely what's going on. And this could, this could be, I would suspect, of course, it's affecting the small intestine, but I would suspect it's also affecting the large intestine. The adhesions are tamping down on there. And if you've got an abdomen full of them, yes. I've got adhesions attaching all over the place in my abdomen. Uh, it's Everything's compromised from diaphragm all the way down to anus, really. Um, and I've actually, just, just before I flew out to the States, I had, a one, I had two sessions with Alyssa Tate, who's my uh, therapist for my adhesions, and she did so much work on me, and it's just great to be under her hands and, and feel so much freer. And boy, oh boy, do my symptoms disappear once she's treated me. And one of the big things, which is really interesting, and even though this is not um, SIBO related, Related as such, uh, but she this time did a lot of work on my uterus and ovaries and said that they were pretty much frozen in their spot and they they didn't move or glide. And so when she frees those organs up, oh my gosh, do I feel a lot better? And I just don't have period pain and cramping like I normally get. And so even though she's, I'm going to her to help with my SIBO, um, she's helping with other organs and I see such great benefit. And I find that generally lasts for a good couple of months before I feel everything tightening up again. And I re and if only we lived closer to each other so I could see her more frequently because we're a two hour flight away from each other. So I just don't see her all the time. But it is worth investigating structural issues. It's been such a big piece of my puzzle and explains now why I'm atypical with my symptoms and, um, and why I need to address this to help my structure so that I can therefore help my SIBO, which in turn helps how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to mention on that, you know, so she's a visceral manipulation practitioner, although I believe she calls it visceral mobilization. <laughs> we, we, I had the pleasure of being in a conference with her. She's wonderful. Uh, and I just wanted to mention, I'm sure you've gone over it in all your podcasts, but just in case, uh, a place you can find visceral manipulation practitioners online. There's a referral network from uh, Upledger Institute and Baral Institute, but it, they both have the same. So if you go to the Upledger Institute, find a practitioner, they have an online list that's international. And you, what you're looking for is that it says by the practitioner's name, VM for visceral manipulation, because they train in other things too, like cranial sacral and other things. So that's one way you can find someone who does that. And also uh, 
our friends, the Werns, they are famous for creating a manual therapy that dissolves adhesions. And they're in the States in several locations. You can go to their website. And lastly, I've just recently discovered a new therapy for treatment therapy for adhesions, and that's frequency-specific microcurrent. Uh, I've known about it for a long time, and I just did not put it together in my head that it can dissolve adhesions. Uh, so that's another thing. And uh, that there are international practitioners. And we talked about that when I saw you in Portland for the SIBO Symposium, and I am really interested in it and going to be looking into it for myself. So to all my listeners, I'll, I will report back in and let you know what I find um, in, in Australia as well from a treatment perspective. What should we be doing with our diet? Should we follow a specific diet for hydrogen-dominant SIBO or does it not matter necessarily what we're eating as such when it comes to all of the SIBO diets that are on offer to us? Um, People often worry that they're eating the wrong food for hydrogen-dominant SIBO. That's not what I see. I don't find that to be the case at all. uh, All the standard SIBO diets are a great match for hydrogen SIBO. There isn't anything that I would say that you need to do different from a SIBO diet if you have hydrogen SIBO. They're they're created for that. They're all they're all created for that. They're all good for that. Uh, what I can say is that when people have an acute flare of diarrhea, something's going on and it's worse, then a diet of just starch and meat seems to be very helpful for a lot of people. Now, starch is a tricky one for a lot of people with SIBO. So there's going to be a proportion of people that can't handle any starch at all. And so the starchy foods are white rice, white potato, uh, and like white potato meaning not sweet potato, and uh, white bread or white pasta, if, if a person can handle gluten, if, if it's okay for you to eat gluten. So, and white bread, like for me, that brings up the connotations of Wonder Bread, <laughs> but white bread is also like sourdough and French bread and Italian bread. You know, you can buy organic and higher, higher class and higher quality <laughs> white bread. So, uh, but particularly what you'll hear people saying is rice. So they'll do white rice and some kind of meat, fish, or poultry, and be a bit careful with the fat, but the key thing is no vegetables. And this would not be long-term, it's just during a a flare. But during flares, see the thing is, I just had so many patients report this to me early on in my career, that that's kind of even one of the ways I started to know that starch could be tolerated by many people with SIBO that I hadn't thought it could could before, because I saw so many people that couldn't tolerate it, but it was these diarrhea patients, when they had a really hard time uh, this would calm it right down. So uh, fiber is can be um, agitating during these really acute flares. I mean, fiber in general feeds the bacteria so they will ferment and make gas, but not, you know, not all fiber. I mean, we're eating vegetables and fruits when we're on a SIBO diet, you know, so it's not like you can't do that, but it's during these really difficult times. So I just wanted to mention that, but all the SIBO diets are a great match for hydrogen SIBO. I I feel that the specific carbohydrate diet is a better match for diarrheal diseases in general, but not when it comes to SIBO. For SIBO, uh, all of them are good, and I think we even see better efficacy with uh, the, the little combination I put together, the SIBO-specific food guide that's SCD plus low FODMAP diet, which is also uh, the SIBO biphasic diet. Neurologists took those foods, put them into phases. <coughs> and then what all your cookbooks are based on is my and Neurologist, it's the same. So that is where we get the most efficacy. And the reason why is because it's the most restrictive, which is also may not make it the best. You know, So it's efficacious, but restricted. What should we be doing just to a touch on um, symptom control? So we've talked about how a starch and um, protein diet can be helpful in, the, in a big flare. Are there any other things that we can do to help when we're a hydrogen-dominant SIBO person? Perhaps we've gone into a really bad diarrhea flare, we feel miserable. What can we be doing that's supportive of that moment in time? Absolutely. So the first thing would be electrolytes. And there's sort of two forms of that. One is what we think of electrolytes. It's like salt and potassium and minerals, some calcium and things like that. Uh, to, to give us our minerals back, 
And that's one thing you can do. But the other part of this is called oral rehydration um, solution or liquid or replacement. And the oral rehydration is the minerals with a, an easily absorbable sugar. So it's either going to be sugar like sucrose or it'll be glucose. And it's really the glucose that we're after. And when you take the, the salts and the minerals with the glucose in water, what happens is the glucose pushes the minerals into the cell. It, it allows a transfer of the minerals into the cell that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So it's way more effective. And it's like the standard of care for diarrheal disease, like a really you know, infectious and acute, horrible diarrheal disease across the world. And so you can, um, you can, you can buy this like Pedialyte is a very famous one. That's oral rehydration. So you need the, the sweetener with the minerals. You can also make your own. And I have the free handout on my website, SIBO Symptomatic Relief Suggestions Handout. I've just updated it. And I always have the World Health Organization's recipe for oral rehydration. But you can certainly buy it. I, I personally just make it at home. It's just like baking soda salt and a little honey, you know, that sort of thing. Or you could use table sugar. And uh, if, you, if you're a person with yeast, that might bother you. So maybe you can't do that if you can't have any kind of sweeteners. But the thing is, you want to look out because a lot of times you'll have electrolyte replacement that will have um, sweetener in it because they're giving it to you in a packet or some way that you're going to taste it. And so they'll put sweetener in it just so it has a nice flavor. But they might be using all these alternative sweeteners. And then that won't, unless it has like glucose or, or sucrose, uh, I mean, you could use one with fructose, but that's not, not as desirable for SIBO. And also fructose has to be converted into glucose in the body. So the thing is, is that then that's not really oral rehydration. That's just electrolytes with some sweetener added to it. So you, you want to be sure you get those particular sugars. And then sometimes they add all these funky sugars that can, bo can bother people, you know, and it all depends on if you react or not. But anyway, on my handout, I have some brands that are mentioned. So that's the first thing I think of, if you're having diarrhea, get some oral rehydration and or electrolytes. But to actually stop the diarrhea, I would say charcoal would be my number one recommendation. Activated charcoal. You should be able to buy it in almost any grocery store or drug store. And you can follow the labels, uh, the direction, directions on the label, but it's usually anywhere from two to four capsules repeated a few times a day. Um, you know, every every so, so many hours, it's a it it binds up. It actually absorbs the the fluid into the little chambers in the charcoal, and it can be really effective. You know, one of the side effects of charcoal that people are worried about, which doesn't happen to everybody, but is constipation. So you're after that. We want that. <laughs> Another thing you could do is bismuth. So like the classic over the counter would be Pepto-Bismol. That also can help diarrhea. And also some of the cramps. Well, so do, honestly, so does charcoal. And um, the, actually, those are probably the main things. I mean, Imodium is the brand name of, you know, an anti-diarrheal. That actually s tries to slow the movement. But I think charcoal is even a better choice. Is there anything uh, just with regards to charcoal that we need to be mindful of in terms of the timing of when we have our charcoal and the timing of our SIBO medication? Yes, thank you for bringing it up. It is that it absorbs, actually it adsorbs, is that medically, technically correct, uh, everything. So if you take it at the same time of medications, it, it will make it so you will not absorb them into your body to some degree. We don't know exactly how much gets in, but you, you don't want to do that. You want to space that away from it. So I'd say you could take your medicines or supplements 30 minutes before taking your charcoal, or if you've taken your charcoal, I would wait probably an hour after, maybe longer. But that's the safest window. I mean, uh, that's I'm seeing that's the shortest window. Thirty minutes before, an hour after. For thyroid medicine, I think you should give longer between the two. Usually, you have to take thyroid medicine when you first wake up. So uh, I would take that right away and probably wait an hour then before your charcoal. Just to be very careful. Just being very careful. But also food. Will, your nutrients will be absorbed by charcoal. So you don't want to take it right with food for too long. I think it's not a problem at all for a couple of days because you're, you will be getting some of your nutrition and this is not going on forever if you're just taking it temporarily. So in a really bad flare, you can even take it right with your meals and I'm not worried about that, but so long as that's only for a few days. What do you see 
clinically with your patients, those that are hydrogen dominant. Uh, people are funny. We, you know, we want to know, oh, do I have the better SIBO? Do I have the worst SIBO? Um, what do you see clinically? Is this an easier form of SIBO to treat or is it no easier than any other type of SIBO? It's easier uh, across the board as a generalization. So, you know, if somebody's sitting here listening who has a very difficult case of hydrogen diarrhea, SIBO never has been able to get rid of, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm talking about the general pattern. The general pattern is it's the easier form. Methane is much trickier. Um, so this is, it's a better prognosis, actually. You know, I know sometimes people do have incredibly recalcitrant diarrhea, meaning geez, there's just nothing that can help it. That's a little different. Generally across the board, this goes quicker and easier. Dr. Alison Seebecker, thank you for joining us on the Healthy Gut Podcast today to talk about hydrogen dominant SIBO. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about methane dominant SIBO, make sure you tune into our interview around that topic um, and that will be coming out shortly. But thank you so much for joining us. Now you have such a wealth of information available for free on your website, SIBOinfo.com and you are also, uh, you've joined us on the Healthy Gut podcast for several episodes you do some amazing stuff with Siobhan Sana from SIBO SOS uh, so there's, a gr there's many places that people can see your work learn from you uh, a question I get asked a lot is are you taking patience <laughs> right right now I'm not um, I'm still on a hiatus from from patients um, it's because of many reasons actually but one is that I the main reason is I'm trying to finish some projects that really just take so much time so the, I've been writing a book for many years and that I you know I feel worried to even say but I think I think I'm about a year out and we're, we're so I'm shooting for 2019 um wait no it's 2019 now <laughs> 2020 2020 spring we'll see I mean I'm it's moving forward and then the other thing is a uh, um I've been working on a professional training course for practitioners and I've been working on it a year so uh, it should be out, you know, I'm in the middle of recording it. So I don't know exactly when it'll be out, that'll logistically, whatever. But so I am sorry to say that I am not seeing patients at this time, but I really look forward to seeing patients again. I really look forward to getting back to it. And in the meantime, I do have a couple of co covering doctors that you can see if you go to my website um, that are kindly sort of helping my, my people in the meantime. And there's lots of other wonderful practitioners uh, and hopefully... If you need help, Rebecca can help you. And my, I have a referral sort of area on my site showing you how you can find a doctor. But anyway, for anyone who is possibly interested in seeing me, I look forward to seeing you as a patient when I come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for all the work you do. You've, you know, you really have been a shining light for us SIBOers out there, and you've done so much work and shared so much knowledge and information with the community. And you know, we are all so grateful. So thank you for sharing your wisdom once again Thank you. <laughs> on the Healthy Gut Podcast. You are welcome. Thanks for tuning in and listening to episode 83 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Don't forget that you can get the full transcription from today's show just by being a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast to sign up and you will receive an email with the transcription from today's episode. And I would absolutely love it if you could leave a rating and review and let me know what you think of today's show and all other of the shows that I have released for you. It also helps other people dealing with SIBO to know that this is the right kind of episode and podcast for them to listen to. I'm Rebecca Coombs from The Healthy Gut and I look forward to seeing you next time. You've been listening to The Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about The Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.